Hello, 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 and welcome to Feedback Friday. It is the art edition. I'm your host, Jacob. Welcome to the stream. We're doing art for Mouse Hunt. How is it going, everyone? Welcome, welcome. Uh, today, I don't know if we'll go too, too long today. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the art streams, I will just be painting live looking at the chat, taking suggestions, answering questions, uh, and uh, yeah, we'll see what we get done today. Um, it's a little bit of a different one today. We're working on a HUD element. I don't know if you just heard the horn, but it was very musical. Uh, it's a lot of construction on my street, so people get frustrated. But that one at least was amusing with it. Um, hello. Oh, you don't like the art editions? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Welcome to the stream. It's Life Stan uh, on Dreshik. I, I'm sorry, but don't know how to pronounce anything. Uh, Vivified, welcome. Swifty, hello. Uh, yeah, doing good. Um, working on the new area. Uh, the uh, School of Sorcery is all wrapped, so I won't have anything for that, but we are working on the next area to come. Uh, so, yeah, I'd say let's just jump right in. Uh, it's not a character. It's not a trap. And, yeah, let's see what we have. I've already kind of, like, begun the sketch phase. I don't want to talk about specifics of what's going on here, because um, I want to let you guys discover a lot of this for yourself. So it's going to be just kind of me rendering stuff uh, kind of day. So but yeah, just kind of adding fun details. Yes, draconic. That's right. Um, and just kind of refining elements here. Uh, you can speculate. I will not confirm or deny specifics about what's going on with this. Um, what are these silhouettes? Who knows? Probably me. All right. Let me just get rid of that. Should be all right. Um, mm hmm. Little, little Ghostbusters green slime. All right, so I think I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go to town on this. Start rendering out some detail. Uh, some. This is kind of yeah, like a cavernous, slimy something. <laughs> a bowling alley. They really like go for a strong theme with it. Yeah, so this is a uh, some kind of like tunnel. Um, I'm gonna be kind of rendering out kind of the walls of it, trying to add some nice kind of rocky texture to it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, it is a tunnel filled with green jello. You nailed it. Definitely lick the walls. Enjoy. What could go wrong? Yeah, so we're just going to get right into it. Um, it'll be probably more of a just kind of like, you know, uh, throw on your own beats, uh, kind of 
work on whatever you're working on. Just kind of enjoy having this up on the side and, and you know, watch as it progresses. Uh, I'll try to take suggestions. There's, you know, maybe not so much that can be done with it here where it's like, I don't know, add another gloop bubble. Um, so, yeah, at least with, like, characters uh, or other... Uh, design elements, there's a little more room for input. Um, so we'll see what we have today. But yeah, it, it also might not be a super long stream just because uh, other things that I kind of want to work on with this um, that I'll have to do off stream. Uh, but yeah, I just kind of want to share what I'm working on. Uh, as well, I believe I will be doing Feedback Friday Art Edition next week. Um, I, I think Dave is uh, he's got next Friday off, so I'll definitely be kind of working on something pretty epic for that as well. It looks like the table of contents, but gooey. I like it. Yeah, gooey is, is definitely the vibe that I'm going for with this. So I'm glad it's resonating as such. I think it's all about the the like the specular reflections, getting that that like crisp highlight of a bright light source will really kind of like make something look wet and uh, and these kind of like soft kind of like gloopy shapes definitely uh, you know actually I'll I think I'll make them more like drips rather than um like stalac might stalactites what one's the one that i always mix them up never sure what one is kind of like dripping down or or growing down or or up Very kind of snotty texture. <laughs> Hopefully this isn't too off-putting for people. It's an interesting texture to render. The table of stomach contents. <laughs> I like it. Mm. Even when maintenance starts, feedback Friday gets to continue. Yep. Yeah, this is uh not gonna be affected by down any kind of downtime. Stalic tights hold tight to the ceiling. I like that. Yeah, I need I needed some kind of uh, mnemonic to is it mnemonic to remember and mites. I don't know, like termites. They make mounds, so that that's also I suppose another one. But yeah, okay. Stalic tights hold tight. I like it. I like it. Okay, so yeah, these. Um, Instead of making them more stalactites, having them being these like dripping gloops. 
Although I kind of like the idea of maybe having some being a little more stalactite. I mean, it could be a stalactite with the gloop coming off it. I mean, that's kind of how they form, right? It's like um, water seeping through a cavern and kind of like slowly dripping down the same path and just depositing minerals that slowly build up. So. Stavik might, might reach the ceiling someday. That's also a good one. Thank you. Thank you for that. A C for ceiling and a G for ground, also useful. Yeah. Uh huh. Good stuff, good stuff. Mm-hmm. Very snotty looking. <laughs> Goal achieved. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, I do want to get some stone look to this place. I don't want it to all be just a snot. It is just a snot. This is some kind of like magic school bus episode where we travel into like a dragon's nostril. It is not that. kind of just satisfying working on an image where I don't need like 17 different layers just to kind of create a character. I'm just kind of painting 
effectively one layer. I have multiple going, but I just kind of like add a new layer when I'm kind of like working on a different level of detail. Um, and I'll honestly probably just merge them at a point. Uh, so it's just kind of nice just painting over stuff back and forth. I don't do a lot of backgrounds, but I do enjoy them. <laughs> Love all the drippy, shiny stuff in Mouse Hunt. We do have a lot of it. It does get around. that go behind yeah suppose I should probably look at this in grayscale as well to kind of like make sure that things are clear right the values are one of the more important ways to kind of like see if an image is working uh, if you can get the values to read effectively. The the image will will definitely succeed. Um, so I think I need some of this. Like I like the level of darkness here on this, and I think I'm just going to extend that over to the sides using a brightness layer. So this will just let me kind of match that value. And in fact, what's over here is actually already darker. Um, but in relation to everything around it, it doesn't look darker. So I need to darken that even further for it to feel similar. Our brain doing its thing of just filling in information even though it's not technically what's going on, you know. Very easy to trick with illusions. Which is fun, because, like, the more I learn about them, the more I try and incorporate them somehow. I do quite like the possibilities that has. So yeah, I think the, the, the elements that are closest to us, I want to have kind of the darkest. Um, at the end of this tunnel, we have kind of the, this light source of some kind. Um, and as well, it's probably going to be damp and foggy or something like that. Nice atmosphere in here. So the further back it goes, the more the light is just kind of like wiping out the shadows and, and kind of like hazy and atmospheric it feels. So as it gets closer to us, we, we get less interference from that light source. We'll still get like the reflections and stuff like that to really kind of like sell the, the moisture in the cave. Um, but uh, yeah, like I think it'll look the nicest if we have kind of the highest contrast and shadows closest to us. And I'm also imagining there's kind of like this texture to the walls. Um, so I'm having kind of like areas recede into the... Uh, it's not just a sharp edge tunnel or anything like that.
So if I do this, it looks like there's kind of like a pocket in the wall or another kind of tunnel going off there perhaps. I don't know if I'd get a reflection right there if I'm kind of like tucking this behind and making it that wall here if there's that piece jutting out, right? That could be casting a shadow here. So we'll get fairly dark down in these corners. Okay. I don't want it to be like too all over the place, right? Um, something I could try doing is, let's see if I remember how to do this here. Um, if I do a layer, um, uh, maybe posterization would work. And if I, where's the settings for it? Hello, pop-up? Should be a pop-up somewhere. No, where it is. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to give this a save before I mess around too much. Okay, try that again. I guess if I just hit enter and then double click oh there it is i found it finally okay, if i drop the number of layers down to like two or three it kind of shows us the main kind of groupings of the gradients uh, and this can kind of just help me assess if if there is kind of like a appropriate gradient um, where, where things feel structured uh, and that seems pretty okay um, I don't know if that's the correct kind of layer type to do this maybe binarization yeah okay this is the same thing as doing like a step um, where it's either if it's like above a certain brightness or below a certain brightness, it either kind of makes it a white or a black pixel. Um, I think it's called step in Photoshop or something. Yeah, this just kind of like lets me see if there is kind of like good groupings. Gets a little muddy there. All right, cool. Seems fine. Okay, so because I was using a um, a brightness layer when I kind of darkened this section here, it isn't impacting the color of the image at all. So it remained kind of as saturated as it was, as it darkened. And for, for shadows, I tend to want to desaturate them a bit, uh, maybe making them a bit warm. Um, so what I'll do is I'll do a color layer and uh, grab a desaturated kind of red and then if I kind of just go into the shadows, I can kind of knock. Actually, saturation is what I wanted, not color. There we go. I mean, color works too, because I'm putting in a very desaturated color.
and we can we can push and pull all kinds of things here. <laughs> the draconic snot mines. It's <laughs> a good name. Yeah, so I'm just stacking layers, but they're not really too important to be distinct from each other. Kind of like this brown catenary kind of vine looking thing. That I could see being a different layer for now. just so that it's easier to paint behind such a detail. And kind of bring that out more, right? thinking maybe I want to um, the the walls on the right don't feel as kind of like defined so I might kind of work on just kind of blocking those out a bit better. And because we have a lot of this kind of green light I imagine the um, just general atmosphere of light is going to have that green tinge to it. A lot of like just light kind of bouncing around in the cavern, I imagine. Instead of being so shiny. I kind of like there being these kind of like different levels of kind of floor. It's really uneven looking. Um, I'm going to kind of create this like pool of ooze on the ground as well. Something like that. So it kind of looks like there's like a step down into this little stream. Perhaps that works. Maybe I should add some bubbles in it to, to help with the idea.
<laughs> yes, indeed, more areas. More areas are happening. I want like a crisp edge on this one. I'm very excited for this one. Not that I'm not super excited for all the areas that we come out with, but uh, it's a lot of fun working on this one. There's a lot of cool elements in it. Maybe I'll get like these kinds of like scaly looking stones crawling up from the wall. I don't want to overdo it, you know, um, but just enjoying adding some texture to this. But I think we can kind of like take it places before the stream is done there's there's a couple of things I might want to try okay so I feel like this is too nebulous I don't really see that object as much um, yes this area would be after the school of sorcery And it does involve dragons. Who all here is working on a uh, M1K map of, of sorts, either the group or solo? I'm working on the group one right now. I'm sure you're probably all familiar, but uh, if you aren't, the uh, Spring Egg Hunt, Lady Laura's Chocolate Shop, uh, the final reward track or uh, shelf, I guess, um, has a very special map scroll case there. It's a group scroll case. Uh, it is not easy, it's definitely a challenge, but a worthy one. Uh, it has a very interesting path of rewards. So make sure you uh, check that out if you haven't already. Uh, if you manage to get all that done, uh, it'll, when ready, uh, unlock access to the School of Sorcery without having to pay the cartographer, uh, as well as other good elements that you will probably want. Yes, yeah, I, I'm excited for you all to get to witness the M1K in all its glory. Um, that was a character that we started on Feedback Friday a while ago, um, before we even had like internal approval of it becoming uh, a piece of the game. Uh, <laughs> I was like, all right, we don't have much to work on today, uh, but you all really wanted me to work on the M1K, and part of doing that together uh, was the impetus to actually like get this content built the way we did. Uh, so I'm very, very happy that we did 
push for that because it's honestly incredible content. I'm very excited for you all to get to go through kind of that whole thing. It's not for everybody, obviously. Um, it certainly is a daunting challenge and it does kind of benefit from having uh, other people who enjoy doing maps with you. Um, but there is some nice rewards. And uh, I encourage everyone to, to try to get at least one of these. Okay, so these rocks are looking a lot nicer. A lot more defined. Can we manifest the Valor Rift Journal theme into existence too? <laughs> Actually, I managed to bring that up um, with the team. Uh, and so there's a little more of that bouncing around in their skulls. They're just really busy with stuff, but it's something that uh, I'm going to keep poking, and you all need to keep poking, and, and eventually we'll, we'll just kind of like make it happen, I think. And then I will no longer get to just like, -ha -ha, look at this, look at the frame that I am in. You don't get this, it's mine and mine alone. Yeah, Whisker Woods journal theme as well. That one I can understand us holding off if we, if we like actually had kind of like the update um, content lined up. We've definitely kind of like done a little bit of prototyping and brainstorming around it, but it's not kind of locked in yet. So who knows when that's actually going to get to see the light of day. But that, yeah, that's another one. For sure. Can you do art for spring egg hunt scavenger map so you can make it into the next spring egg hunt? <laughs> I mean, I, I think that that might be a neat kind of map style. Um, perhaps. I won't, I won't do the art right now on that. Uh, I have other more pressing tasks is the thing that the M1K was kind of like a, well, either we do it or we don't. Uh, and that's why it was able to happen, like why I was able to kind of like start it um, because it just needed that really strong kick and there was kind of like already a desire for it. Um, I can't necessarily just be like, all right, I'm just gonna introduce this whole kind of idea that no one has kind of like prepared for or asked for. That probably wouldn't go as well. But if there's enough interest and uh, demand for it, then yeah, we might be able to to get some movement on on that. So I know it, it'll be me again next week, but the week after, yeah, harass Dave if you really want kind of like certain elements in the game. Um, he's got a little more of the kind of. Uh, ability to make things go into production or not than I do. Okay, I think I want a little more green light on these rocks. Although I kind of like that earthy soil kind of up on them as well. So this is all looking a lot more actually like inside the earth as opposed to this just kind of mushy nebulous 
So let's get a little more of this kind of like crunchy texture back here too. I don't need it to be this crunchy. This is very crunchy. Um, might be too crunchy to be honest. I might, I might uncrunch a little bit of that. Oop, that's not, not a color I wanted. I like the shapes, but I think I don't need them to be quite so jagged and um, toothy, I guess. Uh, other kind of like tunnels, caverns, whatnot, um, might be better suited for that kind of shape language. Because uh, with, with this one, it's more kind of about the gloop. And gloop is soft and shiny. So round and and snotty is a little more kind of in the direction that I think it should be. Um, you know, I'm actually thinking I might cover that more. Hmm. If I connect these. Could be all right. Okay, now this vine is kind of like in the way. No, I'm just gonna let it disappear. It wasn't. It wasn't doing what I needed it to in the end. Okay. Constantly like re just kind of surfacing. Uh, what is the word I want to like when you change an entire planet environment? You it starts with a T, I think. Terraform. Yeah, I'm just constantly terraforming this. This place completely changing the wall shapes so I think I like that being a little bit thicker and heavier feeling um, I'm gonna bulk that up too Give it a little flip. Okay, so one side feels more done than the other. We should probably jump back to the other side and uh, make sure it's not not falling behind too far. Um, so I like these rock colors. I, I want some of that earthiness to come through. 
Um, I don't want it to look entirely snot, you know? I want it to look like rock and snot. Right? Good. Um, I do like this kind of like pool of ooze potential. So, and I, I like the idea that it's kind of glowing in this pattern here. So maybe there's this one as well. That it's lighting up. We can get some of these rocks kind of reflecting. And the further away from it, it uh, the like less intense that reflection or glow. Like I, I guess I think of it more as like a glow from from that. Uh, but yeah, like a candlelight, it falls off quite quickly. Also, if these are kind of facing more towards us, I'm going to have them be more in shadow. That's just like, as an example of how much difference each layer kind of makes, we can just kind of turn them off historically, right? So this is kind of where I started before the stream. Did a lot there, kind of refining it. Is This is where I kind of started the stream. Uh, just kind of tweaking the values and pushing it a little more to be like some kind of underground slime tunnel kind of looking thing, right? Secret tunnel. Yeah, I think I just want a little more kind of obvious geometry. <laughs> Fellow last airbender fan, I take it. I watched the um the live action uh remake. It's not as bad as I was expecting, you know, like I had I had low expectations because of the movie and what that had done, um, but uh, not bad. I've I've enjoyed. I'm looking forward to future episodes, and I'm very curious who Toph will be, because uh, so far the the cast has been pretty all right. It's hard to capture some elements like the rubberiness of Sokka and uh, such, but. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. So far, a faithful adaptation. I was, I was uh, concerned when they they first set up the uh, my cabbages bit 
and uh, they like when I expected it to pay off it didn't and I was like oh no that's like one of the greatest moments ever and they're not gonna play into it how dare they this is the worst um, but then they like they did it they paid it off they set it up where it was a, a little trickery for me so I appreciated that well played Yeah. No, I mean, it's not perfect. I agree, but, but it's hard to kind of like get the same thing, right? Like you can't quite capture what the original is. Um, yeah. Worth a watch in my opinion. But yeah, it does kind of make me just want to watch the original again. Because I don't even know how many of time. <laughs> he is so rubbery. Absolutely is, yeah. Yeah. Actually, um... So the, uh, my axe throwing sheath was inspired by Avatar. Uh, <clears throat> I have the art book. Um, and uh, in one of the panel or one of the pages, there's a kind of breakdown of some of the animation frames. It's got a lot of that. It's a beautiful book. Um, but it had kind of the, uh, the like firebender kind of like, how they break it down. And I was just very inspired by that and decided to kind of try and recreate something like that um, on my axe sheath. And uh, also, don't use maple as a handle on a throwing axe, by the way. Um, <laughs> this, this happened during practice. I haven't thrown this handle a whole lot, but uh, it did not hold up. Um, when I threw it, it kind of, it, it was starting to feel a little bit weird and I was like, something's off and I threw it and it kind of like did one of these as it flew out of my hand. Um, but I'm okay with that, uh, lesson learned and I didn't end up making any maple handles for anybody and have them be all disappointed with, with me kind of doing that. So I'm very glad that happened. Um, that just means that I get to make another handle for my throwing axe, which I still need to put art on, and I don't know what I'm going to put on it yet, but one day, one day, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I have more axe art to share, um, I'll be putting that on my Instagram, I did a pretty, uh, I'm very happy with it and a, um, an etch of uh, Medusa. So I'll share that pretty soon. Just gotta do a little video editing and I got a lot of things I'm busy with so I haven't had a chance to do that. Ooh, and I'm also making um, blacksmith thongs because I, I joined a maker space. Um, a lot of fun, really cool people there. And uh, I have become certified to use their their forge and anvil, so I'm officially on my blacksmithing journey, um, and I've started a pair of uh, tongs that I'll be using. To forge axe heads. One day. I got a lot of tools to make to before I can do that, but goals. It's fun. If you haven't made anything with your hands and you enjoy that kind of thing, I encourage you to find something to, to try out again. 
Um, there's nothing quite like it. It's very just kind of meditative a lot of the time. Um, it's a nice hobby. Don't need to have any expectations for any of it, but it's just kind of just, it's a good thing to do. Keep yourself busy with kind of like a, a unique project that you just can't do any other way, really. Um, so I've, I've really enjoyed kind of getting into that stuff again. learning new skills too so it's been a great fun time oh yes jewelry i've i've been actually thinking of how satisfying that would be to do um because i've been i've been kind of like doing some engraving and stuff like that and it's working very fine uh with like a optivizer and little tiny chisels and stuff um and a lot of the videos I end up kind of referencing and watching just to kind of like learn techniques and such are from jewelers because they they kind of work in the same um, just area of expertise as stuff I'm interested in. Um, like very fine detailed kind of engraving and, and metalwork and such so uh, it's just really cool to like learn how they do certain things and just absolutely fascinating i'm planning on making a uh, a bench peg uh perhaps this weekend so i can do um what i want to do is like a uh some copper cutouts and stuff and do inlays into the axe heads um i did like copper inlay a few times on axes. I did like a hibiscus flower. Um, and on the Medusa, there's like the eyes on the character and all the snakes. They all have um, copper uh, inlay for the eyes. It's a lot of extra work, but like I love doing it. It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, if I had a uh, little bench peg, it'd be a little easier to kind of cut out specific shapes. Um, I'm currently actually making a Majora's mask inlay for a friend. Um, and uh, so I want to be able to cut out that whole shape without kind of like what I've been doing currently has been taking copper wire and just laying it back and forth and just filling in the entire area. And it's extremely tedious and harder than it needs to be. Um, so if I can just cut out the whole shape and just kind of lock that in, that'll that'll be a better way. So I'll be trying that technique out soon. Also messed around with um, copper leaf too, uh, using like egg glare and had semi success with that. It's very messy because I'm not I don't have this the like the developed kind of like skill or proper tools. So it was very difficult to control. Um, and initially all of it just kind of peeled up immediately like on, and stuck to the tool rather than the surface I was trying to bind it to. But I got a few to work eventually. I needed to clean the surfaces, make sure there wasn't any kind of um, uh, like protective coating as well as uh, make sure the tools themselves are very clean and polished. I think what was happening was there was a bit of oil on the, um, the brass stamps that I made um, and the, the foil just stuck to that rather than binding with the, uh, the egg proteins. Yeah. It's cool stuff. Uh, and that's, that's using kind of like traditional book binding techniques using an egg glare, which is basically just uh, egg white proteins um, that you put on the surface of leather and then you literally cook very, 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 very thin metal against that and it permanently binds them. Um, 
egg was actually egg and like starch uh were were kind of like some of the first glue i guess um and it was like animal hide or something like that um yeah stuff still holds up that was bound by that so I figure i'd try out some of that stuff to try and learn how it all works um, I know there's other ways to do it nowadays that you can just get like copper foil or gold foil, um, which is like a lot, lot easier to work with. Um, and those can just be like heat glued into place um, using a lot less kind of things that can go wrong, I guess. Um, but uh friend of mine from the makerspace actually his wife and and him they do like sign work where they do gold leaf um and so he was just kind of like teaching me a lot about that and i just got really interested in seeing what could be done with it plus apparently if you do actual kind of like more i guess traditional methods uh, you can get a lot brighter of a kind of finished piece it looks a lot more kind of like reflective and metallic than the uh the ready to go foil so yeah. not that that matters a lot you know just being able to like imprint metal into uh leather surfaces uh, a game changer for me but again i just a lot of the time just enjoy learning techniques and experimenting and uh, failure is just part of the company that comes along with that, and I seek it out because that's the greatest way to learn, I find. So finding how to fail at something and paying attention to that and uh, just embracing that failure is a very, very, very good way to accelerate your development. So, again, highly encourage anyone who would be inclined to find some kind of handcraft thing. Don't have any expectations for doing well at it. In fact, expect that you'll probably fail at it and be okay with that. Uh, just embrace that that's a part of the journey. And instead of fearing it, uh, try and learn from it. And, you know, after... After long, you'll, you'll probably find yourself actually capable of doing stuff you really didn't think you could. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm certain of it. If you, if you go for it and you're not afraid to, to just kind of like have things not work the way you want it to, but like you have an open mind about it, like you'll be fine. You'll, that's, that's how you learn to do illustration like I do, that's how you learn to become a blacksmith or make jewelry. Um, some things, it's like, okay, you want to have some research done and have someone to help guide you so you don't, like, uh, hurt yourself, like in blacksmithing, right? Like, that's obviously, you know, you want to do it safely. Um, and certain things like jewelry, uh, uh, you know, like, it could be expensive, uh, if you start directly with, you know, gold or something, um, so, you know, start small, start, uh, have, have like appropriate resources to, to guide you and learn from, um, but yeah, focused learning and just kind of embracing when it goes poorly is, is, a how you get there eventually and have fun with it because that is kind of what it could be about I find it's very fun to do that stuff anyways it's got that like rewarding for the the soul kind of feel you know like no one else needs to you know care about this but it feels nice to make something i i remember um 
before I started working at HitGrab. Um, <clears throat> uh, actually, before I went to, to school for illustration, I worked in construction. Uh, I did framing in Ottawa and did that for a year. And uh, I actually end up missing that, even though it was not a, it was kind of like a toxic environment, like the work environment was, you know, very uh, just not 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 awesome you know just construction can be kind of like that you know you get the the kind of bro mentality i guess you could call it but um physically building structure and raising walls and putting together a floor and a house uh was very very just kind of like I don't know, it felt great, um, and I missed doing that for a long time. Um, and uh, so I was, I don't know, I, I'd kind of always kind of missed that physical kind of creation. Um, I did like the, I've done like sculpting and, and painting and stuff, but I do a lot of illustration as my day job. So, you know, I wanted something that was a little more kind of outside of, that realm because i i kind of like like i love what i do here and it's fulfilling um and i just wanted something that was a little bit of a different flavor uh, instead of it being like illustration although i suppose i found ways to to incorporate illustration because i still you know that's that's what i love um hence doing like engravings and stuff like that in my metalwork but uh Yeah, just uh, finding a craft. Do it. You'll be happy you did. Uh, yeah, I am using electrolysis. Um, I do always kind of like put a, a little caveat around that detail. Um, Using live current is a very, very dangerous thing. Um, people I've talked to in the axe throwing world know someone who died doing electrolysis work. Um, so it's not something that I, I recommend for other people to just kind of like dive into. Um, you really need to understand how it works and what you're working with and doing it safely. Um, electricity is deadly and it uh, the process, um, depending on what you're doing, can also off-gas very toxic fumes. So, you know, um, there are different crafts I would recommend before that one, uh, unless you really do your research and do things in a safe manner. I don't want people doing that. Um, so. so there's that. The way I do it is safe. Um, but yeah, just a little, little word of warning, caution around that. So just in case anyone was kind of like, oh, that sounds fun. Let me just try it out. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's probably one of my more favorite things to, to do, um, because basically it's, a different form of illustration when I'm I'm kind of like learning a lot from you know like uh, as a digital illustrator I do a lot of painting and I experiment with techniques because I find that fun um, but this one's the most outside of my wheelhouse yet I still get to kind of like pull on skills that I have developed so it, it works uh, and you know it's teaching me a lot of cool things uh, and also is very just kind of like satisfying. Um, but yeah. Do be safe when you're doing such things, please. Mm hmm. Yeah. Actually helps to get your stuff out. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, that's that's probably the hardest thing is actually starting. I find, anyways, I have uh, a lot of things that I want to do, and I'll I'll be able to think about it forever. You know, I can just keep kind of like thinking about how much I want to do something, um, and it's literally been years that I've been like, man, I really want to do some blacksmithing. I want to try that and uh, learning about it and all that. But I did finally find a place and get a get to be a part of a workshop um, and finally got to do it. And uh, a lot of other little projects where it's like, I would love to do this, but you know, and then it, you just kind of got to make yourself start. And once you do, then it's so much easier to keep going on it. Yeah, starting's absolutely the hardest part. Absolutely. I find that maybe one of the uh, better ways to kind of like get that impetus um, to go is it, it can be good to have in, your inspiration like what for me i'll maybe watch creators that do that craft and and kind of like watch what they do and feel inspired by by witnessing that um and that's good for like getting me in the headspace of wanting to do it uh but then the next thing to do or perhaps even the first thing to do is actually just determining like what is literally the next singular step if i if i took one single action um what what is it so like as an example if it was like i wanted to go to the gym and work out the very like first step is to like put on my gym shoes or or like pack my gym bag and put it at the door and like that's the action that I would like force myself to take, because once you start doing the first step, then the next step's not as hard. Um, and if you think of it where it's like, I'm gonna do this thing, I'm gonna work on this weaving project where it's like, okay, I gotta do like this whole thing and lay it all out and like, you know, uh, just kind of weave for days, kind of like I I don't know weaving so well, but. Um, no, it's easier if you just kind of like, you kind of have an idea of what it's going to involve, but you just kind of figure out what is literally the f the first step I need to take on this, you know, who knows how many steps marathon. Um, and then just once you've determined it, just go and do that one first step, you know, like pull out your, your knitting needles and put like a loop on your first needle and that's it just like make yourself do that one thing and it's like well now that i've started okay i'll just do the next part um i have like a little setup in front of my tv where i work on kind of like engraving stuff um and uh i'm trying to kind of get that majora's mask a little kind of inlay done and so the next step is to just kind of like raise the walls on that. So actually during my lunch breaks, I go over and I just kind of like turn on the little ring light I have, put on my optivisors and pick up my chisels. And since I've done that, you know, it's just that easy to just, okay, well now I'm working on it. Um, so yeah, just figure out literally what is the step that you need to do and, uh, Start with that. Don't think about the whole thing. If you think about the whole thing, it becomes uh, like just intimidating. And, you know, like it's, it becomes this giant monolith of a challenge. Like, oh my gosh, that's so much work. Like making a whole quilt is months of work, right? Um, but if you just start with like a single panel, and then you do another panel and you just kind of like make them one at a time eventually you can build a you can craft an entire quilt you know so 
how it goes. Yeah. Okay, so we are at 1216. Um, I will go on lunch at one o'clock and I don't know, like there's there's stuff to do on this. Um, I might finish up this kind of detail pass by lunch and we'll determine if we want to continue because uh, I go for an hour on my lunch and then if I'm only going to be streaming for like another hour, it might be better to just push back my lunch and go for the extra time until I'm done. Um, but I don't know if I'll be streaming for two, 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 two much longer. So uh, we'll we'll have to figure out if we want to like have more post lunch or if we just want to wrap up whenever I take lunch, right? So I guess we'll we'll come to that when we get there. But yeah, less than an hour before we have to kind of like make a decision on that. Yeah, honestly, um, I learned something about kind of like motivation uh, that that I think is important to understand. Because um, like I I have ADHD and I have so many like super interesting projects on the go. Too many, in fact. I have too many projects that I work on at all times. Um, and I love them. But I can also end up kind of like hitting these kind of slumps you know everybody does you get writer's block you get artist block you get kind of like these these challenges that like deplete you and you it's hard to kind of pick up the pencil um and and kind of like push past you don't even know why right that happens to all of us it's just a part of being a creative um but something that I've learned uh, about motivation specifically is a lot of people are of the mindset that it's like a muse, you know, like this this element that comes to you and you just you just wait for it and you know eventually it'll come and then and then you can do it. You'll have that proper inspiration. And that happens when you start stuff. You get this kind of like this passion, this spark of like, oh, I have this really cool inspiration and idea and you you begin right um but the the reality is, is that le that kind of like motivation will run out i guarantee before you're done right um the excitement of kind of like starting something new will kind of like patina over and it becomes work um and so you you kind of lose some of that fun and and so it just, it goes kind of like into a space where it's harder to, to like find that motivation, as it were. Um, it doesn't just come to you. Uh, so one of the things I learned about motivation is don't rely on it. You don't want to use motivation to actually work on stuff. If you rely on it, you're never going to finish stuff. You have to be able to, like, become determined, having um, the, the just deciding to do it. Like, you have to do that at times. Um, so the more you exercise that, the better you'll be. Uh, I, I heard it described once where, um, like, discipline, like, people are like, some people just have discipline, um, but something that's kind of interesting and I never really realized until I heard it is that discipline's actually like an emotion, like joy and anger and fear and all that. It's actually like an emotion. And, and when you kind of like understand that that is kind of like it's it's a state that you can enter, um, you can kind of like decide you want to chase that and decide that you you want to have a emotional state of resolve um you know uh and 
it may be a little more nebulous and harder to kind of understand that, but like you can kind of just when you're in a good enough headspace for it, at least, you know, it's not, not all the time you can always do this, but you can just literally make a decision and, and make a kind of agreement with yourself or a contract with yourself where you're just going to resolve to do a thing. And when you do that, you kind of like tap into this emotional state of like, just, you know, resolve and discipline. And, and you just kind of have to just literally make just an agreement to do it. And once you do, and you just kind of commit to it, you're just like, okay, here is step one, first action. And I'm determining, I am deciding to just make the space for that right now, or, or like this evening or tomorrow at this time, um, and you commit to it, uh, then suddenly you'll be tapped into that thing that you thought you needed, um, motivation. It, it, that's where it actually hides. So you just got to make that contract with yourself to pull, pull yourself into that. And it's not easy. You know, you have to understand that like, uh, it's work, right? But like once you're doing it and it's kind of like the right thing, you enjoy it. You know, um, the, uh, the maker space I go to, it is a bit of a commute for me and I have a lot of like things I'm working on. So it's hard for me to make the time to get out there. Uh, and every time I had made the time to try and go and blacksmith, something came up. Um, I showed up and they had, you know, like a big meeting with all the members at the exact time I showed up and there's only like limited slots for new members to actually go and work on projects solo. Uh, and so I wasn't able to do any blacksmithing when I went, um, because, you know, it makes noise and they were running like this big important meeting. That's like a yearly thing. So it's just incredible timing. Other times I've gone in, um, there was like someone welding in the hot room, so I couldn't really kind of like pull out the forge and anvil while they're, you know, making blinding sparks and all that. Um, and like every time I tried, uh, like it, it kind of like ended up not happening, but I did end up doing other things that was like really good and I, I felt good about being a part of those. Um, but every time it kind of like didn't work, I got, it got harder to kind of like try again. Um, but I just kind of like ended up deciding like, well, I'm just going to keep trying until I make it happen. And the total eclipse on the Monday, um, I had traveled out of Toronto because Toronto wasn't like actually properly, uh, in the totality and it was just a go train ride away to actually get under the totality. So decided to do that with a friend and, um, it was entirely worth it because I lucked out, managed to actually have like a slight break in the clouds just as it was happening. I actually got to like see the total eclipse directly. Um, it was, mind-blowingly cool like literally once in a lifetime experience i'm very glad i did that and then on the way back um i just decided like well you know what instead of going directly home i'm gonna go to that space see if i can do a little bit of blacksmithing and it, uh, there was like a project going on where they were you know uh just refining a bunch of scrap wood that they collected from from someone. Uh, so I helped a bit with that, but then I, I just kind of like was like, you know what, I'm setting up the forge, you can't stop me, <laughs> kind of thing. And I did it. And uh, I actually started a pair of blacksmith tongs. Uh, it took me forever. It was very difficult, hard work. Um, and, you know, uh, I was doing it solo, so it was just kind of like figuring it out as I went. Um, 
I have blisters on my hands, like this one's kind of like receded and healing. But yeah, I was hammering for many, many hours and I loved it. It was great. Um, and I have something that somewhat resembles sort of tongs uh, without having any tong capability yet. It's still got to get like the rivet and the actual bits need to be shaped and all. But you know, I'm very glad I finally actually got that going. Um, and now I'm excited to go in and do more of it. Uh, we'll see if I can. <laughs> But yeah, there, there are times when you hit like blockers, right? And they will kind of make it more and more and more difficult to, to kind of like push through the more it happens. Um, but you can, you can do it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> which of my hobbies would I say requires the most discipline? Ooh, boy. The challenge is I have too many hobbies, so I have to kind of, like, think through them. But, um, I guess... Coding? Um, that's actually another <clears throat> big hobby of mine. I haven't done it for a long time, but I have a game jam coming up that I'll be doing with, uh, my brother and a bunch of friends, um and classmates of my brother. So I'm actually going to be kind of the project manager for this game jam uh, starting on the 26th. Because um, uh, it's it's a lot more people than we probably need to do a game jam. But a lot of people have been like, interested in doing a game jam together. And uh, I figure, you know what, like, this is an opportunity for me to develop my kind of like team management skills, which is kind of like a useful thing, especially in game dev. Um, and it's something that it's sort of something I get to do a little bit of, but not nearly as much as um, other people. And if I have more experience with it, it, it can mean I can help more uh, with like, building mouse hunt locations I want to, etc. Um, but yeah, I would say that like learning coding and using that has been the hardest for discipline um, and requires the most. Uh, I actually started this year calendar thing um, when I started kind of like realizing I needed to kind of like do my own hobbies and what that thing is is it's just literally like one block for every day of the year and uh i when i kind of like commit to stuff and i push myself to do it and i i remember to kind of like do that for myself i actually mark it off on that calendar and my goal is to just every year just kind of fill the whole thing and honestly there is a lot of days where i don't do it and then i just kind of back log and fill the space because I don't <laughs> it feels bad to have gaps but it is what it is it's just a reminder of how much time is left in the year and um, it's another kind of like little piece of kind of like uh, rote I guess um, but uh, yeah it's it's helped um, and uh, me and my brother will do like weekly calls where we discuss projects and code and stuff like that. And that's been helpful too. We kind of hold each other accountable in that sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the journey of a thousand miles begins with only a first step, 100%. 100%. Yeah, if you're thinking of, like, every step you require to do the journey, you'll never start it. The best way to start is to actually just, like, put one foot in front and lean into it. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a fact. Never run out of fun things to learn. 
Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm catching up on the chat from much earlier. Um, I'm kind of jumping back further because I realize I missed stuff. Uh, yes, gold foil is an expensive uh, craft to learn, which is why I'm learning with copper foil. Um, the, the friend that I have at the Makerspace, he, he actually just has books of copper foil, and he literally was just like, here, take these and experiment. Um, so that's been incredible. But if you want to experiment, I would recommend, yeah, like starting with a cheaper, like something like copper foil is probably all right. Um, it's not as good. Like it doesn't, you can't get it to work quite as well. Um, but there's also more difficulties with gold. Uh, and yeah, I think like a, a tiny booklet that covers like a square foot area of like proper real foil. Uh, gold foil is like sixty dollars, um, so it's like, yeah, no, not not where I'm gonna start um, at all. And plus, like with the the leather sheaths that I make, uh, I use copper rivets, so I'd actually prefer copper over gold, anyways. But if someone ever comes to me and they're like, I would like it to be gold foil, then you know. I'm developing the skills to actually make that a thing for them, and that'd be a cool project to take on. Um, so, but yeah. Um, ooh. Yeah. Doing a wire wrap in gold would be very, like... I can only imagine. Um, I've watched uh, Ford Hallam. Hallam, he's got like a really good uh, metal smith. Um, he he kind of it's like Japanese metal smithing, um, and he does like a lot of beautiful work. But I've watched a video where he's kind of like uh, collecting gold dust. Like he's got his his like metal smithing bench. And it's got this like leather pot like pouch that when he's like filing and cutting and, and all kinds of stuff uh, with gold and silver and all that, it catches every little piece and like you use like tack to get all the dust, all of it. Um, and he ends up kind of like refining the dust that he has and he ends up getting like a decent little kind of chunk of gold out of out of that. And so it's just like, Working in that medium is like you need to not like let a single grain escape kind of thing if you want to kind of be, I guess, cost effective with the material. Um, but yeah, it seems like a really interesting challenge um, that like having a good smart setup can can make your life a lot easier with that. Um, he, he talked about, like, uh, at the end of every year, they basically send off um, piles of just, like, <laughs> dust and, and like, the, the sticky rubbers that they used to pick it up and stuff um, so that, like, a proper place that specifically refines... Uh, can recollect the gold and send it back to you, I guess. Um, but I guess that's just like a part of fine metal jewelry is, is that that can be an element. I don't know if all of them practice that where it's like you recollect every single little grain, um, but if done right, it seems like it's worth it, right? Um, yeah, it seems like a really, really interesting field. Like, I guess part of the challenge is, like, I wouldn't know what kind of jewelry to make, but I think I'm kind of, like, learning similar techniques and skills, so I might just want to try it one day. Uh, honestly, like, I might even just do something like um, trying to, like, inset a stone into an axe or something. So, like, jewelry uh, proxy stuff where it's like using the same techniques, but it's not specifically a ring or an earring or something that I'm making. It's it's more 
related to what I I do. Um, because I guess part of it is like I don't do the jewelry thing, so I don't really have that interest in it. Uh, but yeah, I'm interested in the skills. It it kind of like has. I I enjoy finding ways to cross over skills and mix them together and discover new techniques because of that. So I definitely have been learning things from jewelers and what they do because it's really cool. Like, mad respect. Mad respect. It's really impressive. Um, let's see. Yeah. Buying new materials for a craft can be a nice impetus. Um, I've definitely had an issue in the past where it's like, I buy uh, something that's almost too nice to work with and I'm too afraid to like screw it up. Uh, at least that's what I used to run into. Like a, I'd get like a brand new sketchbook and I'd be like, I don't want to like ruin the sketchbook with crappy drawings. So it just like sits in a drawer and collects dust and never sees a pencil. And it's like, yeah, it's silly. You know, don't, don't do that to yourself. It's a worse fate to like not use it than to to like experiment and maybe not make something perfect. But yeah. Uh, also, don't strive for perfection. That's a terrible idea. It's fine to try to make something that you're pleased with, and if you don't then analyze it and try and understand where it went wrong. But like, don't go for perfection ever. Even if you're a master at it, you know. You never reach perfection. So strive for good enough. Strive to learn when you're doing something. That's a neat place to be. I like to, whenever I'm working on a project, experiment with something I haven't tried. Um, like literally every sheath or uh, commissioned kind of like axe detail that I've done, I've tried out new things that I hadn't done before and learned new stuff. There's always things to try, always things to learn. Um, yeah. What is a game game? Uh, you might have, yeah, game jam. Okay, great question. Sorry, I didn't see that until now. Uh, a game jam is actually where you basically give yourself a very small window to create a game. And so the one we're joining is two weeks long. So the team that I'm, I'm working with, we have two weeks to build an entire game from scratch. And when you enter into a game jam, generally, there's different rules for it, but the general idea is you do not know what the game is about going in. Um, you don't have like a theme set up where it's like, oh, it's going to be like a, a zombie survival game or something like that, right? Um, you go in with no kind of like, and nothing is like ready and prepared other than maybe you're like set up with your kind of like your your you know your game engine and maybe you have some like boilerplate code depending on the jam some don't even allow that um, but when the game jam officially begins not all of them but a lot of them they like create like this is the theme for this jam it could be something weird like goopy or or in reverse or you know like it, it's usually something that's kind of like uh loose and you can interpret it however you want um and that is supposed to kind of like be inspiration for what the the game becomes you know like if it was like in reverse or or like upside down or something maybe you'd make a puzzle that you know is is like using 
reverse controls or or like uh, you have to like deconstruct something or you know you figure out like whatever you interpret that as um, but part of what that does is it it helps break you away from trying to build a game that you wanted to you know like a lot of people that get into game design and stuff they have like this is the game I've been thinking of this is the game I want to make here's my idea and the problem with that when you're when you're like new to game dev is that game is your baby and you're going to be really wanting that to be a success and you're going to put so much work and effort into it and it's going to be garbage it's going to be terrible because the first games you make are bad they're just bad they're not good um you know they take so much work and experimenting and failing like in mouse hunt mouse hunt i would absolutely state started as a bad game it it got lucky if it got an audience and people you know enjoy it enough but like in terms of game design all all kinds of things like the beginning of the game is bad arguably i i think it's not great there's a lot to improve and i would love to go and improve it at some point if if possible um but at any rate a game jam forces you to not go in with like this is my baby that i want to create it's like you have to just come up with something really simple because it's got to be done in a very short amount of time. Some are only like 72 hours long. And people make full games. It's crazy. And like sometimes it's just one person making the whole thing. Usually it's like one to like three people. Um, uh, I haven't done a jam that is with more than four people. This one I think we have like six or seven potentially. So it's going to be a very interesting challenge. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's really about like exercising those kinds of skills and, and kind of like, um, because there is a, a, a start and end date, it is that kind of like commitment, you know, like I have committed to beginning this jam on the 26th until the 6th, uh, uh, me and everyone that's a part of it, we have, we have determined we have kind of like made that personal contract that we're just gonna we're gonna like connect to that prod or to that jam <clears throat> we're gonna see what the prompt is we're gonna get together and we're gonna like talk about what we could make together um and then at that point we'll we'll have put our first foot forward and then we just need to decide okay what's what's the next footfall you know, okay, this person, you begin by coding that and you start creating concept art for this idea that we think is fun. And then, you know, those kind of like get to a certain state and then we get together and we, we see, okay, what's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? Until eventually you have something that's ready for sub submission or you run out of time and you maybe didn't complete it you failed in that regard but you probably learned something you probably like uh even though it was like a, a abject failure um if you reflect on it and you kind of like analyze it you can kind of determine like okay you know what we we can take something away from this even though we didn't even get anything submitted um this has taught us like hey you know what we bit off more than we could chew we tried to be we tried to go big. We tried to do something that was too much, you know? So the lesson here is like, go even simpler. Um, and this is my advice for anyone who is doing any game jams is to literally like, it should be like the dumbest, simplest, most basic game you could ever make. Um, you can take any game and keep polishing it. It can be, like the simplest game ever um and you can spend months refining it and making it even better uh without even changing how the gameplay works so start with like literally the easiest easiest thing you could make and make that first and 
you know, you want, you want to have successes. Those help, you know, like actually completing something, even if it's not like an incredibly awesome blockbuster game, you know, that is a win. And to be able to kind of like build your motivation, you do need wins, you know, like it can't all be failures where it's like, man, I'm just, I'm learning stuff, but like, I'm never feeling like I progress. Like you need to, you need to have wins. So you need to set yourself up to succeed. Um, so, you know, learn why you failed, pay attention to that and use that knowledge next time. And hopefully you can course correct to the point where eventually you have some, some kind of success and success in a game jam for me is you submitted the project and it's something that you feel okay about sharing with other people that you know, you know, um, that to me is a, a huge success. That's my goal. I want to reach that where it's like, Hey, I made, I made this thing with some people. Do you want to try it? If that happens, that was, that was awesome. I succeeded. It doesn't need to be a good game. I don't expect it to be a good game. Like if it's simply just like click a button and, you know, dodge some pipes kind of thing. Like literally just like um, Flappy Bird. That's fine. You know, it still takes practice and, and knowledge to build Flappy Bird. And you can make the most polished Flappy Bird ever. Um, it's not a unique idea, but that's okay doesn't need to be sure if you're like trying to you know get the prize for the most creative game probably not going to win with that but those goals are for like when you've kind of gotten more jams under your belt and it's like okay well like now that i know i can finish a game jam and i can submit it in time and i know how to do that now i can try to maybe like win a category here or there if that is something that you want to try you know but don't go in with that kind of expectation like ooh, we're going to win for the most like brilliant game design and it's going to be super clever um but it's actually way too complicated and you don't end up building it because of that every game jam i've done i've submitted well not every single one i've definitely failed them um, but of the ones i've submitted um, I was proud of them. They were submitted and I shared them and, you know, they're very bad. There are bugs, which like, if you're wearing headphones while playing, it can like hurt drums, and that's not awesome. Um, and every single one of them like is very, very incomplete. You know, like it, you're playing through it and it basically hits a moment where it's just like, okay. We ran out of time. Um, there's not really anything to see beyond this point. So thanks for playing. Bye now. Um, and that's fine. It's a game jam. It should only be like a, a five minute experience to play it uh, anyways. But um, all of them have been like really rushed and unfinished in my opinion. Uh, finished just simply being it has like audio, it has menus and all the elements that are placed in it are like completed and somewhat polished. Um, there aren't like just ridiculous typos or just like a button sitting there that literally does nothing or, or is just kind of like broken. You know, like my goal for this one is to uh, have a finished game in the game jam. Um, submitted obviously is like the the kind of the the main goal um so we'll see it's it's a large team it's harder to work with more people to be honest uh it takes more like you'd think you could be more productive with a large team but it's actually a little bit of the opposite at times especially when you're not used to working together um and it's an unfamiliar space so that alone is going to be the biggest challenge i think is is managing the team um but my goal and how I'm going to run this with people is I'm going to 
uh, effectively be like, okay, day one, we get together and we determine what are we making and maybe get some concept art created, get some of the, the basic kind of structure set up for the code, figure out who's working on what kind of thing and, and get that going. Um, halfway through the timeline for the, the game jam, my requirement for the team will be that it's, it's effectively completed. Like it is playable. Anything that is going to be in the game has some kind of placeholder. So if we have like, um, let's say it was a platformer we decided to make, we have like five levels placeholdered in. We have like two monsters or something like that placeholdered in. Um, and we have like the mechanics required, like being able to jump or collect items and get to an exit point um, and the movement system and the main menu uh, and basically any anything that is actually going to be in the final game, I would be like, we need to have that in the project. Anything that's not in the project by that date is cut. Like, no adding bazookas after that date. If we want bazookas, we have to agree on it and add it in as a placeholder minimum by the halfway point. If it's not there, it's not getting, I'm not allowing it. It will be cut. Um, and this is something we do with mouse hunt development. Um, when we're developing areas, there's a lot of times when we, we like, have these really like, oh, wouldn't it be really cool if we like added this mechanic to the area? Uh, I think this would be a lot of fun. Let's, let's discuss. Um, and ultimately, a lot of the time it comes down to, well, you know, like this doesn't fit the scope of what we've decided to do. Um, and so, although it was a cool idea, it doesn't end up being developed. And honestly, it's appropriate to do that. Like, it's disappointing at times for me because I'm like, oh, that was a really cool idea. It would be fun to have that feature or something like that. But it's totally the right call. Because um, uh, one of the things that's amazing about the team is we really don't work overtime ever. Um, that's like a big issue with the, the games industry a lot of the time is people are kind of like, the, the teams aren't managed with uh, the, the workers in mind. Um, people get overworked and they're expected to like pull crazy, you know, tight deadlines and stuff gets rushed and it gets, it, you end up with an inferior project because of that. Um, so that's something I really appreciate about the structure of our team is, is like, we don't allow ourselves to get into that situation. Um, if it's like, if there's a chance of it screwing up our timeline and, and like, you know, pushing us back or, or making us miss our deadlines, we don't allow it. Uh, it really has to be like, this will absolutely work or it's cut. Um, so I'm going to use that kind of mentality going into the game jam and run the team that way. And, uh, I think that'll help because as I stated before, like you can polish a project for years and keep, you know, adding quality of life and feedback and, and stuff and just make it like really what it is really good. Uh, so the first week is building that base of the project. The second week is just polish. Fix any bugs. Get all the placeholder elements in. Make sure it's feature complete and just kind of keep polishing until it's time to submit. And then, you know what? That's that's the goal. Um, that's a success. You know, it's it's safer because it's like, by the end of the first week, we should be able to submit it as like a, you know, like completed project. It's just not polished, but I, I would like to have a polished game jam. And with this many people, it seems like 
it's maybe a possible thing to do. So we'll see. That's that's how I'm approaching it anyways. Um, I know that was just a, quite rambly. That's what you get with Feedback Friday Art Edition. Jacob Rambles. Welcome to the Jacob Podcast. Hope you are enjoying and feel inspired to get out and create. Yeah, so game jams are a really, really, really incredible way to get into game dev. If you are at all interested in building games, I absolutely couldn't recommend it enough. There's a website called uh, itch.io. There are always game jams on there. Um, you don't need to have any skills. You just need to have kind of like the, the interest and the drive to, to actually try to learn it. Um, you can find teams in any of those jams. Uh, they often have like a Discord that you can join and meet people. Um, there's, there's like beginner jams, which are awesome for that. Like just being like, hey, I'm learning to code. I need an artist or, hey, I'm an artist and I need a coder or whatever you can offer. You know, you can probably find a team that will be interested in working with you. And then it's just kind of like, you know, figuring out how to work together. Hopefully the other team members um, have the right mindset and, uh, and it can end up becoming something cool. Um, yeah. Go for it. Do it. Make a thing. It's very fun. But, you know, game jams aren't for everybody. They they are like you in in the in the game jam world you're expected to lose sleep. Um, because you know, it's it's like a lot of them are just like, you have literally just a weekend to build this whole thing. Um, so I don't want to print. Um, so, you know, you, you kind of like determine what kind of involvement you want. And, you know, it's not something you want to necessarily do nonstop because a lot of them are very kind of like, you're expecting to kind of like, overwork yourself on this weekend and then take a rest because you know you did it so just a heads up about that mentality around game jams is they they can be a little bit more of that burning the candle on both ends style of creation um but you know that's not a requirement of it like you can literally just make a game that's just simple and doesn't need a due date doesn't need submission anywhere uh doesn't need to be a game jam structure to just do it um, one of the things we'll be doing is we're, we're going to be working in godot um, i'm familiar with unity i've i've been learning unity for years but there's a lot of frustration with the unity community with the practices they've been um, doing as a company and also uh, Godot just seems like it might actually be more, kind of like, offer more of what I want. Um, Unity gets a little bloated and Godot seems a little more focused. Um, and I like learning new things, so learning a new game engine will be cool. Um, but that'll be part of this challenge, is kind of learning a new a game engine. And uh, so, you know. Exciting, but part of what I am going to chew off. All right. Oh, it's one o'clock already. The power of rambling and drawing at the same time. Time just literally flies. Um, I'm going to save because that's a good thing to do. Uh, let's see. Have I done glass blowing? Oh my gosh. No, I haven't. Uh, I had a friend who is in the glass pro blowing program at Sheridan. I have watched it. It's crazy cool. Uh, I've just not had the opportunity. If I ever get the opportunity, I will try it. I've actually thought of trying using just like uh, 
simple glass and torch just to see what manipulating it's like because it looks kind of cool to get it gummy and then it hardens and it's neat i've not tried it it would be cool it seems like a great challenge um and many failures but many lessons to learn um, but also it's one of those where it's like i would want someone to show me how to do it and, and guide me it's not one where it's just like i'm just gonna make a a crucible and melt some gold in my backyard and just go for it um yeah yeah all right let's see Oh, yes, that's a great point, Sally. Um, joining groups that do your skill is massive. Um, the, uh, the, the place that I, I do, um, the collaborative workshop place, it's called Site3. Um, it has like a Discord where there's different channels for each of the different kind of disciplines, and there's lots of skill sharing and conversations. And yeah, absolutely, forums on Facebook, um, Reddit, wherever, uh, there's communities for every craft and you should connect with any that you're interested in. You'll get inspired by them. You'll learn more than you could possibly from like anybody else. There, people in those spaces are just excited to share. Um, so find those spaces that interest you and become a part of them. Absolutely a great thing for, you know, getting into it um is having that community and you know you you inspire each other um let's see yes do you work together through the whole game how much of the two weeks is devoted to construction how much analyzing what you've done yeah i mean uh yeah uh usually yeah it's 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 like every team member is constantly working on it for the span i mean Within reason, you know, like we have our lives to live. It, the weekend ones, the 72 hour ones are the ones that are are kind of like, you know, losing sleep like and nonstop work. The two week ones, it's kind of like, okay, go do your job. And then the evenings maybe put in like three hours here and there. It's, it's really up to the team or who is involved to determine just how much they want to be involved. Um, with this one, because I have so many people that I'm working with, it will likely be a case where like there's nothing for that person to do right now so like test it or or just take a break you know um and and we'll we'll, we'll ha like that's probably going to be the hardest challenge honestly with this jam for me anyways is just trying to like manage that where it's like i try and keep people effective but i guarantee there will be a lot of times where it's like i don't know what to, what to have this person work on Hopefully I can find something, but I have a bit of experience with that. Like the art team, we are four artists and sometimes we have a ton of art we need to get done. And other times it's kind of like, okay, well, like we don't have anything on our task load until next week. So I guess find something, you know, and, and it's going to be a bit of that. Uh, but I have some, I have some experience with it. So we'll figure it out. Um, all right. So is the light coming into the cave green or is the slime green and the light is white slash sunlight? Just curious. I believe in this case, it's probably like maybe a, like sunlight, pure light. And as that light comes through, it's kind of like just hitting this kind of like misty green haze and bouncing off the slime. And so it's just getting more and more green tinge. Um, if anything, like I might actually put more of a green hue over the whole piece, um, but we'll see. Um, yeah. I'm glad you've been enjoying Scrib Dev. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, inspiration is the challenge um, for, for creatives. Absolutely is, absolutely. It's something that I've, I've battled with. Um, but like you have good days, you have bad days. There's no question about that. Um, and I've been, you know, an illustrator on this one specific game for 16 years. And you would think that it would be hard to like come up with new ideas about what to do with fantasy mice, but, uh, 
there is no room for waiting for inspiration. There is n none of that. None of it's like, that's not being a part of my workflow for most of it easily. Um, I, I got to a state with it where I can just kind of like engage it and it works. Um, I, I've developed enough trust in myself, I think it is, that like when I start something, it doesn't look good to start. That's also another thing you need to realize. Um, when you start a project, even if it's familiar work, especially if it's unfamiliar work, it's going to look terrible almost until it's done, right? Like what I do on stream here, I tailor it so that it, it kind of looks a little better than how it might if I was doing it off stream. Um, but an important thing to realize is that like, it might look like the worst pile of garbage up until like 95% completed. Um, but if you just kind of keep at it and, and like use that elbow grease and just kind of like have that, that resolve, that emotional kind of determination, you've, you've made this contract with yourself to just do it, even though you don't feel like it, just, just actually push yourself to take that one first footstep. Uh, and even though it, like it's looking back at you and it's like, what have you done? Why did you make me, um, push through that and eventually you'll be able to kind of like either develop the skills to kind of refine it um, or you know you might just discover that like wow I just kind of like figured out something and suddenly it's looking better than it did and you know you just keep at it um, but yeah uh, being afraid of failure is probably one of the biggest kind of things that is a blocker for people. So I would encourage everyone to seek failure. Um, and I, I think I'm actually, I'm going to wrap up stream with this um, just because uh, the stuff that I want to do on this after, it would actually be better to not reveal. There's, there's layers to this, I'll say. So um, I'm not going to show any of that, um, but I, I'll, I'll kind of like hang out with the creatives. We'll, we'll wrap up together. Um, there's no time lapse on this video, uh, uh, but there is a layer link. I will share that now, actually. Um, but yeah, I ooh, thank you, Michelle and Larry. Here is a post sharing some fondue, which I need right now. Um, so yeah, I would I would definitely say that like fear is the mind killer. You know that that famous nugget um but yeah like chase so this is this is the area i i chase when i'm working on stuff i chase that edge of failure i want to like be so close to failing something that like it it will absolutely fail a lot of the time but when it doesn't you know that's exciting for me um and when i do fail it's exciting because i learn from that but like i don't feel or I don't fear failure. The thing that, I, that I'm that i cautious about only when I'm kind of trying to develop skills is like, okay, am I being realistic with my my time management? That's, that's a big part of ADHD is I need to kind of like have a little better kind of like management to that. Because if I just take on this huge project and this huge project and this huge project, I can't actually physically do all three at the same time. So I have to like, be like, okay, I can't do that thing yet. So that I'll put a pause on, but this one I can, I've committed to, to like getting into this thing. Um, and then I, I will expect to fail and be excited by what that can teach me. Um, and, uh, I will be safe with it. That's an important thing. You know, like don't do something dangerous if you don't, you know, like if there's a potential of injuring yourself or something, you know, be wise around that. Um, learn how to stay safe with it. Like there's a lot of things that are physical creations where you could, you know, um, breathe something you shouldn't um, or, you know, like get something in your eye. You need to be aware of that stuff. You know, if you're, if you're doing physical work that involves chemicals or, 
or you know like smacking stuff that that could chip or whatnot like just be aware that those are things um uh you know and and like if it's gonna be an expensive thing to get into um start small start simple um but beyond those things beyond kind of like is this realistic for my own kind of like um day to day can i fit this uh is it can i do it in a way that is safe and is it something that i can bear the burden of absolutely wasting materials uh if if you can kind of check all those off then go for it and go to fail like as miss frizzle would say like make mistakes get messy you know um and yeah have fun with it though like that's that's honestly what it's about is kind of like the fun of discovery and experiment and just kind of like not knowing if you can do something like this and then discovering that yeah it's possible you know um i never went into like creating sheaths expecting to do anything like this um it was just a case of like i watched some videos they were inspiring i decided i wanted to try making uh leather things and i made a sheath and people were like what is that like can you make me one and and it just kind of snowballed from there um and it was always just kind of like what's the next step what's the next step um and then every time that i felt comfortable with something and i felt like i understood it enough then i would add on a new thing to experiment you know painting it dyeing it uh tooling it adding ribbits trying different materials combining different materials um using a, a tool i made to do a thing on the materials uh etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and you just kind of like you know you don't start here maybe you can maybe maybe you know how to do that maybe you can figure it out but like don't don't start with the end game in mind with uh with the blacksmithing stuff specifically um i am new to that i am only first learning how to like uh heat stuff hold stuff and hit stuff right and the part of that journey is like i i have this goal where i want to make a throwing axe from scratch so i want to make the handle i want to make the head and i want to make the sheath two of those things i know i can do i've made handles and i've made sheaths i've also failed at those i failed at making sheaths i've failed at making handles and i've learned from those and it's awesome um i haven't made an axe head but i also know that i'm not capable of that yet so i'm building the tools that i require and by doing so i'm building the school skills and i'm working with people that know more than me um, and eventually i believe that i will get there i will make an axe head someday it may take a long time i have no idea i don't care um i'm just gonna figure out what i need to try next and see if i can figure it out so who knows maybe in a in like a few months i'll be showing off like an axe i made that'd be incredible um but yeah hopefully this was a an interesting stream for you um i hope you are inspired to go out and just try something figure out what you want to do and just like literally what is the step to take right now and uh just go secure that make that contract with yourself believe that you're able to put your shoe on and open that front door or whatnot and you'll begin um but that is literally the hardest part so uh i shall see you all next week um it's possible we'll continue on this avenue with something a little different uh, this avenue being this avenue um but i don't know i don't know what we'll work on next week it could be a new mouse um for the a draconic area but uh yeah we uh we'll we'll hang out next week um i i hope to hear of what you had what you have started or re revived or whatnot um because yeah we should all be doing cool stuff and having fun learning um but yeah all right well thank you all very much oh yeah i've definitely watched forge and fire i watch like so much related to just people hitting hot metal it's it's 
a hobby to just absorb. Um, I, when I'm illustrating off stream, I tend to have videos of people crafting jewelry, le leatherworking, blacksmithing, machining, all kinds of like just people creating stuff. And I just listen and look over and it's, it's hopefully what you do with me where you're working on your own thing and you're just kind of like tuned in to just hear me ramble about what I'm doing um, and maybe pick up stuff if you're interested. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I've, I've watched Forge and Fire. I've watched lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of just people making things and, you know, that's, it's, it's good stuff, but you can't just watch, you know, like it's fun. It's, it feels good, but it feels even better to just try something. So, you know, break out some Sculpey, get your knitting needles, whatever you do, just pull it out and just put some paint on the canvas and get it going. All right. Well, I shall see you next week and uh, I hope you all have an amazing week. Um, I'm going to be doing forging tonight and tomorrow probably. So I'm excited, but uh, yeah, I shall see you uh, in the week and uh, I, I would like you all to take care of yourselves and to take care of each other. And uh, until I see you next week, happy hunting, everyone. I'll catch you later. All right, bye for now. Bye.